So we refer to everything as COVID, but that's actually the disease that's caused by the specific virus. And so the virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what we do know is it was first seen in, um, in China, you know, um, probably December of last year, and then obviously made it its way over here. Um, the common symptoms that we tend to see are gonna be fever, um, headache, body aches, cough, and the kind of classic thing that kind of distinguishes it from other things would be loss of taste or smell, which is kind of, you know, kind of distinct to this particular virus. Um, we also see some GI symptoms, so some patients might complain of diarrhea. Um, and I think that this is useful to kind of maybe differentiate between the flu because the flu and COVID can present very similarly. So both you might have fever, you might have cough with both, body aches and headaches, but the GI symptoms tend to not really go along as much with the flu and the same goes with the loss of taste and smell. So um, those are some ways to maybe distinguish between the two. I do think that um, you know, certainly kind of keeping an eye on how the symptoms evolve is gonna be important. Um, if you develop fever, then try staying at home, you know, trying not to um, expose others to the virus until you know what we're dealing with. Um, but certainly if at any point in time things continue to progress, certainly if it affects breathing or anything like that, then that needs to be evaluated right away. Um, but those tend to be kind of the most common symptoms that we've been seeing. First and foremost, I do think if you suspect you have any symptoms related to COVID, you need to avoid potentially exposing others. So that means if it's on the morning that you're getting ready to go to work or school, you need to stay home and then you need to contact your primary care doctor. Because um, what will happen the majority of the time is your primary care doctor can kind of guide you in terms of what the next step would be. Ideally, you know, if you're um, at a place that has the capability for testing, then your primary care would probably make arrangements for you to be tested. Um, but I think first and foremost is really just to kind of minimize potential spread to other people until you know what you're dealing with. When COVID really became a thing here, we uh, realized that we didn't want to expose our vulnerable po patient population to you know possible exposure. So what we ended up doing is kind of converting our urgent care to the respiratory assessment center. So what will often happen is if you call and, and you know, talk to your primary care about the symptoms you're having, they're gonna direct you to be seen there. Um, we do testing there. We do both pre-operative testing for procedures, but we also do symptomatic patients and we kind of separate those in time um, just so that again, we don't <laughs> mix well people with uh, ill people. Um, and then what we're doing is um, the physician can, can offer a video visit. And so to kind of gauge just how ill a person appears to be, because if they do feel like they need more than just a test and maybe they need to have their vital signs checked, see what their oxygen levels are, et cetera, we do have physicians that staff that assessment center. And so you can make kind of a slotted appointment to be seen by a physician there. And um, I work it every Tuesday afternoon and so we're full on PPE and, and you know, we're evaluating patients and, um, and sometimes it's a very easy appointment where you say, look, we're, we're testing you, go home, get some rest, drink plenty of fluids. Um, but then other times, you know, if there's any kind of concern about, you know, respiratory distress or anything, then there have been times we've had to, you know, send people to the emergency room and things like that. But so that's kind of a good, a good place um, to, to be able to evaluate our patients. Unfortunately, for most patients, um, treatment's gonna be supportive. So really the only FDA approved um, treatments are gonna be things like remdesivir and even um, steroids, dexamethasone. That's strictly for patients who are hospitalized and patients who have severe enough disease or are requiring oxygen or even ventilatory support. So majority of patients we're gonna be seeing in the clinic or you know, in the, at the assessment center probably are not gonna fall into that category. So for those patients who I would probably classify as mild to maybe moderate disease, um, it's really just symptomatic care. So making sure that they're getting plenty of rest, uh, which is easier said than done sometimes, um, making sure that they're staying hydrated, um, 
and then using over-the-counter medicines to treat the symptoms. So we continue to advocate for acetaminophen or Tylenol use for any fever or aches. There was kind of some thought process that with the use of the non-steroidals that you might actually cause worsening of the virus and it all has to do with the receptors that they bind to and other things. So it, it, it was felt that it was probably safer to stick to acetaminophen. I think that was more so in like pretty severe disease. I think what we know now is if you have a patient who um, let's say has a really high fever and Tylenol isn't bringing it down, then there may be a role for you to alternate kind of the two. Um, but ideally, if you can, try to stick with the acetaminophen over ibuprofen for that reason, that just we, we are not 100% sure all the interactions um, that go into play with the receptor of the virus and the way these drugs work. And so there was always the potential for worsening infection. Um, if there's you know, sinus issues or like a lot of congestion, then you can get a decongestant over the counter. Um, but those are the biggest things. Um, and until we know more, then you know, we might have more treatment options, but this is obviously such an evolving <laughs> thing that um, we're just constantly learning new things about it. So the things that I think are super important are um, definitely wearing a mask when you're out and about. If you're gonna be in any close proximity with someone who's not of your household, you need to have a mask on. I mean, obviously you're not gonna wear a mask at home with the people that you live with, but when you're gonna be around other people, um, wearing a mask is gonna be incredibly important. I get asked a lot whether or not cloth masks are just as effective as, you know, surgical mask. Um, and I think it really depends on the, the character of the fabric, but obviously you want something that you can't just blow through. Um, so something that's, you know, a pretty reliable fabric, as long as it's covering your nose um, and kind of even through your chin. So you kind of want to cover this area here. Um, that's going to be, you know, one of the big things. In addition to face coverings, when you're out and about, um, trying to, we try not to say social distance because that makes it sound like you're isolating, which is <laughs> not a fun way to think about it. So physical distancing. So trying to keep at least six feet apart from people when you're out and about. So at the grocery store, or even when you're interacting with neighbors or other people who are not of your household, you can still kind of have that social component, but do it in a safe way. Um, and then obviously like hand washing is gonna be super important. And if you don't have access to um, soap and water, then using a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol content. And, um, and then staying home when you're sick. So if you have a fever, you, you don't feel well, stay home.